Good afternoon, everyone. This is Melissa Lapsa from Oak Ridge National Lab. Pleased to welcome you to our first Jump into STEM webinar on our sensors and controls challenge that we have. Jump into STEM is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy's Building Technologies Office with support from Oak Ridge National Lab and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I'm going to give you a bit of an overview on Jump into STEM, and then I will turn it over to Bethany Sparn from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, who's going to talk in more detail about sensors and controls. Our vision with Jump into STEM is to inspire the next generation of building scientists um, by focusing on supportive creative ideation and diversity in the building science field. The Jump into STEM program provides a gateway or on-ramp for undergraduate and graduate students to experience the research and career possibilities of building, studying building science. And our intent is to attract students from diverse majors and diverse backgrounds. How we're organized with Jump into STEM we have our sponsor, Mary Hubbard, from the U.S. Department of Energy. We have Dr. Kim Trenbath from NREL, Jahi Simba from NREL, myself, and Dr. Yunjin Bay, also from ORNL. We also have a lot of uh, professors who are working with us to promote our Jump into STEM program. Although any student can participate in Jump into STEM if they're enrolled in a U.S. college or university, our professor team helps us uh, by uh, promoting the Jump into STEM program at their school, and many offer it in their classrooms for student grade this fall. We have professors who are engaged from Georgia Tech, Hampton University, the University of Tennessee, Colorado School of Mines, Southern University, Clark Atlanta University, the University of Alabama, and North Carolina A&T State University. We also have an advisory panel that helps guide us on our outreach and the program as a whole. And they, they represent Oak Ridge National Lab, the National Renewable Energy Lab, the National Science Foundation, and Oak Ridge Associated Universities. So with Jump into STEM, our goals emphasize cultivating diversity of thought by underscoring the importance of interdisciplinary teams, inclusive of women and minorities. And the Jump into STEM works with the university and college professors from a variety of disciplines to promote to support creative building science challenges that can be integrated with coursework curricula. Jump into STEM's network includes leveraging public-private partnerships with industry partners and STEM organizations to support the annual student challenges and events. So with this slide, you can see how we're organized um, and how it works. Eligible students can compete for paid internships at either ORNL or NREL. You can go into our website at jump.ideascale.com to view the eligibility requirements and the full schedule. You can click How It Works at the top of the home page to view a step-by-step -step process on eligibility, building a team. Each team should consist of two to five members um, from at least two different disciplines, ideation and idea submission requirements. Also on the top navigation bar is a schedule for the uh, Jump into STEM 2019-2020 competitions. So eligible students can participate in any of the three concurrent online challenges that are running now through November 15th. These challenges are supported by an online webinar series like this uh, designed to provide insights on industry practices, market issues, and other supporting resources to help students build and generate their idea solutions. Additionally, through our, throughout the competition, we will host periodic events to spur innovation and creative thinking. And after the three challenges close on November 15th, we'll run a judging process to select the finalists. Those finalists will be invited to NREL January 31st to compete in that uh, finale event, the in-person event. At the in-person event on January 31st, after the final competition, we'll award the summer 2020 Jump into STEM internship winners. So again, you can visit our website at jump.ideascale.com for details on how it works, eligibility requirements, and schedule updates. So our first challenge uh, topic is sensors and controls for residential buildings. And this is what uh, Bethany is going to speak um, more on. But this challenge um, is for residential buildings. Participating uh, competitors interested in this challenge topic should develop an, a unique application that uses sensor data for residential buildings for the purpose of reducing energy, maintaining or improving occupant comfort, 
and or to provide better responsiveness to the electric grid. Strong Ideas will present a proposed approach, identify the sensor data, and how the data will be used. The idea should also discuss the, impacted, the anticipated impact and a tech-to-market plan for the application. The second jump into a STEM challenge topic is to design a healthier and energy efficient air distribution system for small commercial buildings uh, using your local climate zone. Strong Ideas will identify a novel system for the selected climate zone and will present implementation of the solution in a hypothetical or existing building. The solution should articulate the expected impact from the design system and also include a tech to market plan. The third jump into STEM challenge topic is focused on pushing the envelope with innovative wall retrofit designs. Students are challenged to design a residential wall retrofit product or system that can address replacement or supplement of current leaky and unhealthy walls. Strong solutions will identify how the wall retrofit will work and will be inclusive of details on how to address issues of moisture and air tightness. Additionally, the idea solution should address one or more of the following issues low indoor air quality, high energy costs, and or high retrofit costs. Like the other jump into STEM challenge topic, the idea, topics, the idea solution should include a tech to market plan. So those are our three current challenges that are open until November 15th. They're all on the website. We're gonna have three uh, technical webinars per topic. Um, and if when we get to the end of this, the webinar today, we'll open it up for any questions that you may have. But before I turn it over to Bethany, I just wanted to highlight a little bit uh, about the final event, which is a lot of fun if you're selected to come to NREL at the end of January. So this is where um, the finalists will pitch ideas in person and it also enables um, an opportunity to network with other students, professors, industry stakeholders, and lab staff. So our three winners from last year, two were awarded internships at NREL and one at ORNL. Cade Lawson uh, won an internship at NREL, and uh, a little bit about what research he worked on this past summer. We had Sarah Tinsley work at ORNL, and finally Carl Woodard worked at NREL this past summer. All three had a great experience. You can see more about their experience uh, logging onto our website on past winners. So with that uh, short overview of Jump into STEM, I want to turn it over to Bethany Sparn to talk about sensors and controls in more detail. Bethany has a Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Colorado State University. She joined NREL in 2010. Her research focuses on connected building loads, residential HVAC equipment, heat pump water heaters, automated home energy management devices, and whole house performance field testing. She has supported the design and build-out of the Systems Performance Laboratory in the Energy Systems Integration Facility, which provides a test bed for evaluating home energy management systems, demand, demand response strategies, distributed energy resources, smart appliances, and other innovative sensors and controllers. So with that, I'll turn it to you, Bethany. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. My name is Bethany Sparn. I work in the Residential Buildings Group at NREL. And as Melissa said, I do a lot of lab work, and um, especially in the sensors and control space. So I hope you find it as interesting as I do. Um, so homes uh, really suffer from a lack of sensors and controls, especially if you think about something like a car as, um, as another system that has a lot of sensors and controls information available. So the dashboard alone gives the driver a lot of feedback on car speed, engine speed, how much fuel is used, how much fuel is left, um, a lot of information on um, warning signals, things that maybe aren't working as well in the car. And that's just the information that's available to the driver. There's a lot of other sensor information that's collected that's used to optimize system control and diagnose problems before they become catastrophic. Um, homes do not have this much information available. Homes today, for the most part, have two pieces of information available. Um, the temperature of your home, if you are standing in front of your thermostat, for most homes don't have smart thermostats yet, so 
The only way to know what the temperature of your home is is to actually stand in front of your thermostat, and that means you're only knowing the temperature at one point, um, and your monthly utility bill. And there's a lot of things that affect your monthly utility bill, um, weather being a big one. So knowing how your behavior impacts your overall energy use is really hard to tease out with something like a monthly utility bill. Um, and on the control side, very little external controls. And by that I mean um, controls that are available if you're not um, standing right in front of the device. So there's a lot of opportunity here um, that I'll, I'll try to dive into today. So lots of benefits could be realized if we had more sensors and controls in the home. With more information, we could learn about equipment failure before it happens. So just like in a car, um, if you can know that there's a, a big problem um, in your engine before it actually fails, that allows you to get it repaired before you're, you know, stuck on the side of the road, which is a lot more inconvenient and also more expensive to get those problems fixed. Same idea in the home. If you can know that your air conditioner is going to fail before it actually does, um, not only can you avoid the, um, the catastrophic failure and, and being without that service for an extended period of time, you can also make better decisions in terms of energy efficiency. If a critical piece of equipment fails, you're not going to spend time researching energy efficient options and trying to shop around. Um, so having that advanced knowledge of a system failure can have a lot of benefit, not just on the, the cost and convenience side. Um, better sensors can give us uh, more information about where there's opportunity for energy savings, places where we could improve comfort in the home, um, and potentially using uh, local renewable energy more. So I'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. Um, but of course, we need controls. So just having the information doesn't help us if we can't act on it. So we need to also have, have more, um, more ways of controlling the home. But I would like to stress that uh, the answer here is not to just put every sensor in the entire world in a house. That's not cost effective and also may not be useful. If you don't have a way to act on the information um, or even a way to analyze that data, um, you're not getting any benefits. So it could just be increasing cost. So to, to try and think about these problems a little bit more in more concrete terms, I wanted to go through a couple of different example scenarios. Um, this first scenario is, um, is, is dealing with solar panels on your roof. So some utilities will not pay consumers um, for any excess, excess power produced by their solar panels. This is called net metering. Um, if your utility does not pay net metering, it might make the economics of having solar panels um, a lot different. And if you have solar panels, it might make their benefit um, a lot lower. So the scenario here is you're not getting paid for excess generation. So you'd like to use more of the loads in your house during the day when power is being produced that may not otherwise be turned on during that time. So it seems like a pretty simple scenario. But when you start to get into the nitty gritty details of how you might implement this, um, it kind of shows how much additional infrastructure might be needed in the home. So if I'm thinking about this problem, I, I'm probably going to target some, some larger loads and also some loads that if I run them during the day, I can still take advantage of that energy I put into them later on when I'm home. So for instance, turning lights on during the day when no one's home isn't useful. It's just a way to, to use energy. If I heat my water heater during the day, it's still useful when I get home and want to do dishes. So I don't have to have the water heater run exactly at the same time um, as, as um, I'm using hot water, for instance. So in terms of sensors that I'm going to need, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to need a whole house power meter. So I need to know when I go from pulling power from the grid to exporting power to the grid. So I want to know at what point um, is there more energy being produced at the solar panel than is currently being used. I'm also going to need some information about the state or the power consumption from the loads I want to control. So I need to know if the water heater is already on or if um, e either I can know that from a power consumption or just a, a state flag to understand on or off. But I also need a little more status information. So if the water heater is off, I might think I can turn it on. But if I understand, if I have some information about how hot the tank is, that might tell me that no, the tank is totally hot, so I cannot turn it on. So I need to understand both whether the devices are on or off, and if there is room for them to be um, turned on. 
But then I also need those controls. So if I had a smart thermostat, that would give me access to turning on the heating or air conditioning in the home. But there's not a lot of systems like that for um, a lot of other major appliances, water heaters, for, for example. I would need some way to send on off or set point control to the water heater. Um, electric vehicles or a battery would be a great thing to use here. So can I, um, if I had those in the house, could I um, turn those on or set a charging rate? And then I also am probably going to need a whole house control system. I don't want to turn everything on all at once and run into the problem of then exceeding how much power is being generated by my solar panel. So I need something to coordinate and make sure that I'm doing a good job of using as much power as possible, but kind of spreading it out through the day. So a lot of pieces would have to come together for us to um, be able to actually implement this solution. Okay, scenario two is a little bit simpler. I just want to save energy when no one's home. So when no one is at my house during the day, there's a lot of things that are still drawing power. Um, so I want to use some sensors and controls to figure out what's running when no one's home and turn them off. Um, I'm going to target appliances that are not needed when, when no one's home. So again, things like lights are a good example, um, miscellaneous electric loads, all those chargers and um, home electronics in my um, media area, my home office, small appliances, even the water heater and air conditioner can be, um, their operation can be changed when no one's home. So again, I'm going to need some um, whole house power information just to understand what's going on in the house. I'm going to need some state information or power data from all these different devices I'd like to control, and some sort of occupancy sensor or sensors. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail in a moment, but learning occupancy in a house um, and knowing it definitively is pretty hard to do. So I need something to tell me about um, if someone's home. And then again, on the control side, I'm going to need on-off control for all these appliances that I want to control or some sort of set point control in, in some cases. Um, and then it'd be nice to have a whole home control system to coordinate to make sure that I, you have full control over all these different devices. So I just wanted to go through a couple of scenarios just to try to um, give a little bit of my thought process of how I would, how I would get to a solution, um, what sort of package of sensors and controls I would think about. There are lots and lots of different types of residential uh, sensors out there. Um, just wanted to throw out kind of a kind of a list here. It's certainly not comprehensive, but just to think about all the different things. So I've touched on power and energy meters. Um, temperature and humidity sensors are going to be really important if you're controlling air conditioning or heating systems, water heaters. Occupancy sensors, if you know when people are home and not, that opens up a lot of control options. Um, air quality, health and, health and um, safety in the home is really important, so can we implement more air quality sensors for that purpose. Light sensors could be used for controlling lighting systems or um, automatic shading systems around the windows. Water and leak detectors, again, this is a health and safety issue. If you can detect a leak quickly, it can really um, reduce damage. Um, Device-specific sensors, so this is starting to get into both how you might be able to control something, but also understanding its performance over time. Um, that might tell you about whether it, there's um, some faults that need to be addressed. And then weather sensors are another important one. Um, this might not be a sensor that needs to be co-located at the house, but maybe tapping into um, local weather stations or um, weather services that are available. But which sensors are needed in a house really depend on the goal. So what are you trying to do and, and which sensors are needed to, to give you the information? Um, what can be controlled in the house? If you don't have any ability to control uh, lighting or shade, probably having lighting sensors isn't going to be very useful. Um, and how much savings can be realized? If, if sensors are being put in to help um, achieve energy savings in the house, understanding how much energy savings could potentially be, could be realized is important to understanding whether sensors are even a cost-effective thing um, Lighting is another good example here. In, in residential buildings, switching to a high-efficiency light bulb, like an LED bulb, may be the biggest source of savings. Um, controls on top of efficiency bulbs may not be worth the cost of the lighting sensors and lighting control systems. Um, 
Then there's some really interesting questions about can you use existing sensors? Smart thermostats, for instance, usually have some sort of occupancy sensor. Could you tap into that for some whole, whole house control? Are there other more innovative sensors out there that could be used to um, reduce costs and deliver more data sets? So a um, lot of interesting questions on the sensor side. So I'm going to talk about a couple different types of energy sensors, um, things that are, are an area of active research. So we've talked a lot about power and energy meters. We really need to know what's going on in terms of energy consumption in the house. But um, power meters can be expensive, especially on the installation side. So the picture in the center here is a picture of a, a breaker panel with the cover off and a bunch of uh, power meters installed. Whenever you need to get into the breaker panel, um, you should be hiring an electrician for the installation. You should be turning off power to the house, which is inconvenient. Um, and a lot of times, whole house power isn't enough. So you might need to install some whole house power sensors, but if you need to know more granular power data, you need to do something more. So that could look like circuit level power meters. So again, this picture in the middle is showing all these little orange boxes are um, current transformers for this individual breakers. It's expensive um, and a lot more labor intensive, but there are other options. Um, there's a lot of interesting research being done around uh, load disaggregation. So taking a whole house power measurement, as shown in these graphs at the bottom, and teasing out some of the patterns of the power consumption, um, information about time of, uh, time of day that the usage happens, to try and understand um, what different devices are being used um, without actually measuring them directly. So that's an interesting option that could reduce costs. There's also some non-intrusive options that are being researched. So if you can avoid getting into the breaker panel at all, that um, is going to reduce costs, be safer, be something that um, most homeowners can do themselves. So this was a project where we worked with a company um, that made these stick-on power meters that actually stuck to the front of the breaker and used um, uh, electric and magnetic fields to infer um, energy consumption. So, a um, lot of interesting ways of inferring power and energy data that maybe doesn't require the full um, many, many circuit um, breaker measurements. Occupancy sensors. Again, this is a, this is a difficult one. Um, ARPA-E, which is a division of the Department of Energy um, that funds really hard problems that have really difficult solution. So they recently funded a big program looking at occupancy sensors in buildings and how to do it better because this is such a hard problem. Um, occupancy tends to be a binary measurement. Is someone home or not? But you could imagine that it could be much more granular if there were systems in the home that could take advantage of it. If you knew that there were people at home but they were only in the bedroom um, and you had the ability to only direct heating and cooling to those, those rooms or um, electronic controls for the rooms that people were not in. You could imagine there being even more savings available. But right now, um, occupancy sensing tends to be more of a binary measurement. And there's a lot of interesting ways of doing occupancy sensing. Motion sensing, sensing tends to be the most common. So you think of um, those motion sensors that are found in bathrooms and different um, conference rooms. But that tends to be not the best solution in, in residential buildings, or at least shouldn't be the only measurement in residential buildings. Just because you're not walking by an occupancy sensor in your kitchen doesn't mean you're not home. You could be in bedrooms, watching a movie, um, in an office. So just having a motion sensor measurement alone is probably not enough. Um, geofencing is something we're seeing a lot more, especially with smart thermostats. So if you had all of the smart homes in the house paired to some central controller or the thermostat, and you could say that if no one, none of those smart thermostats was uh, located within two miles of the home, that you could assume that no one was home and, and go into a lower power state. Um, data traffic on a router is another thing that I, I've heard a lot as being used for occupancy. So these are just a couple of options, but um, occupancy sensing is a, a very active area of research because it is both valuable and, and hard to do. What else might you need? So there's a lot of other information that, that could be useful for, for various different problems. Um, mentioned this a little bit already, device-specific device information, both for understanding 
what that appliance is doing and what controls are available based on what it's doing, but also um, more information um, looking at you know, something like refrigerant pressure for an air conditioner could tell you about um, whether the system was installed correctly, whether there's problems that have occurred over time. Um, tank temperature for a water heater could be similar. Even just knowing the power consumption of a device over time, if it's starting to use more and more power, that might tell you that um, there are problems that need to be addressed. Um, Location-specific data, again, this is, this is very valuable if you had systems that could act on it. Zone control for um, heating and cooling, for instance. Weather information, again, is going to be really important. Knowing what's coming in the future may change how you want to control systems right now. Um, past usage information or patterns of operation. So this is starting to get into learning the people in the home and understanding what their patterns are and using that information to help tailor the control. So if you know that no one is going to shower outside of the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 a.m., maybe you can let the water heater drift most of the day and just make sure that it's hot in time for showers. So that's another area where you could have some energy saving. Um, we haven't touched on this a lot, but understanding price of electricity or whether there's demand response coming. So a lot of utilities are rolling out time of use rates. That's what the graph on the lower right side is showing. If you know what, when the price of electricity is lower and when it's higher, you could change um, the time of day that controls are, that, that appliances are used. Um, and demand response events coming might also help you anticipate um, different, different usage patterns um, to save money and energy. But it all comes down to controls. And like I said earlier, most, of, most appliances now do not have external control options. Even things that are billed as smart appliances may or may not have any external controls. Smart appliance as a term doesn't really have a strict definition. So just by calling something a smart appliance doesn't really give it um, the ability to receive external control signals. Um, there's a lot of different ways you might want to implement control. Um, voice assistants are taking the smart home world by storm, so you might just want to be able to control things on demand using your voice. Um, turning on lights or changing the thermostat set point from, from a, a voice assistant might be a really good option for some people. Um, Having on-off control remotely, having a set point control that's remote, or some variable control. So dimming lights would be an example of variable control, um, changing the charging rate for an electric vehicle or a battery. Um, and then what type of control should be implemented? A schedule might be a really nice option, especially if you live in a place with a, a time of use um, electricity rate. Um, if then control. So if uh, if the temperature outside is below a certain level, or if it's raining, turn on the heat. Um, Occupancy-based controls. If people are home, do this. If people aren't home, do something else. And then model predictive controls. So this is starting to get into that question of if you can learn people's patterns and predict when they will need things and when they won't, then you can start to do more sophisticated controls. And model predictive control is just one of many forms of more complex controls that are available. So um, it can definitely get a lot more complex than just um, a schedule or if then. Um, having a whole home control system is valuable in most of these more um, comprehensive control strategies. So that's usually called home energy management systems for residential buildings. Um, and they're not very common. Even when you think of companies that are doing a lot of work in the smart home space, um, you're still not seeing a lot of companies that are developing truly comprehensive home energy management systems. Um, but as we implement more and more sensors and controls in homes, I think that we're going to see more of these because you really do need something that can manage um, what's going on at kind of a higher level. Now, a home energy management system could be implemented using a physical computer, a physical hub in the house. But it could also be virtual and located in the cloud. Um, if all of the communication protocols being used are wireless, then that cloud-based controller is much more of a viable option. If you have some wired control systems, um, that, that makes that a little bit harder. You'll need um, something physical in the home to, to make that communication link. Um, 
But I do think that uh, home energy management systems will have uh, a, a big role to play if we really start to see the proliferation of more sensors and controls in a house. Um, and to emphasize that point a little bit, <clears throat> um, just want to highlight that this is a big area of re research for us. Um, NREL developed our own home energy management system called 4C, and last year it won an R&D 100 award. Um, this system is designed to connect to uh, any appliance in the home that has some external control system, connect to a utility for um, rate information, weather service for forecasting data, and also take information from consumers to understand what their preferences are and what their um, priorities are. So this is just our solution. This is the way we've thought about the problem, but it's certainly not the only way of, of looking at it. Um, but I wanted to share this just to show you that this is a this is a really exciting area of research and is definitely something that um, the national labs are working on. So um, anything that you guys can do to help move this space forward will be beneficial for for lots of people. So um, that's all I've got for you today. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to happy to take them.